Welcome to the Plato Paradigm, a paradigm shift in reading Plato's dialogues, episode 101, Mino 81a to b. We've just seen Mino make two attempts to avoid answering again what is virtue. The first time he blames Socrates for numbing him into aporia, but Socrates points out that he is as numb as Mino, in other words, he has no answers either, and he suggests that they should search for an answer together. This is precisely what Mino doesn't want to do, so he comes up with the second strategy based on an heuristic question. The heuristic question, which doesn't appear in the dialogue, is how do you ever learn anything? Who learns? Is it the one who knows or the one who doesn't know? The one who knows won't even look for anything because he already knows. The one who doesn't know won't know that he's found what he's looking for and therefore he too doesn't learn anything. Mino adapts this question to his own needs and claims that there's no point searching for anything. The trick with this heuristic question, as with all heuristic questions, is that the two options offered to the opponent are extreme. Either one knows everything or one knows nothing at all. And Socrates here could point out to Mino that there is a middle option, the one which does allow learning or discovery, and that is where we begin with some information, some understanding, and then build upon it. Socrates, who does want the conversation to continue, will no doubt now explain to Mino why he is wrong to consider things in black and white, complete knowledge or complete ignorance. Socrates has already told Mino that he isn't impressed with the argument, the heuristic argument, and Mino would like to know where Socrates thinks that it is wrong. So we would expect Socrates to explain in a rather complicated way for me, know how he should consider the matter rather than the black and white way he is used to. We recall from the beginning of the dialogue that Mino treats virtue as a thing. It's either in Attica or it isn't. It's either in Thessaly or it isn't. If it's in Attica, it's not in Thessaly. If it's in Thessaly, it's not in Attica. Mino is not used to abstract thinking. So this is what Socrates has to deal with. Someone who can only see knowledge as a thing, which one either has or doesn't have. And there is no middle ground. After Mino asked Socrates if he didn't think that his argument was well said. Socrates uh, then said he didn't think it was well said, and Mino asks, Eches legen hope, can you tell me where, whereabouts, you think it isn't finally said? Mino's question, can you tell me, is reminiscent of Mino's first question at the very beginning of the dialogue. Socrates says, Egoge. I can indeed. A keko agar androntikai gunai kon sophon perita thea pragmata. For I have heard men and women experts on divine matters. Tinologon legonton. Saying what account? Alethe emoigedokeen kai kolon. True, it seems to me, and fine. Notice that Mino asked what account, but Socrates answers as if he asked what sort of account. He's simply raising Mino's anticipation, and Mino has to ask again what account. Tine tuton, kai tines hoi legontes. What is this account, in other words, and who are the ones speaking? 
Socrates' failure to answer the first question may be because the question is wrongly allocated to Mino, and in fact this is still part of what Socrates says, saying some account anyway. Hoimen legon ton hiereon te kai ton hiereon ho sois me meleke perihon metecherizon tai logon ho joist enai didonai. Those speaking are as many of the priests and priestesses as have taken an interest in being able to give an account about the things which they practice. We've already seen that Mino is greatly attracted to the mysteries, and so Socrates has given him priests and priestesses as knowledgeable sources of information. Since Mino likes to quote famous individuals, however, Socrates adds a great name. Legede kai pindaros kai alloi poloi ton poeton hosoi theoiesin, says Pindar as well, and many other of the poets, as many as are divine. Pindar was a great lyric poet who had already died by the dramatic date of this dialogue. What's interesting is that Socrates uses priests, priestesses, and divine poets as the common source for this account, and yet he's picked out Pindar, who he's going to quote in, in a minute. Does Socrates himself think that poets are divine? Does he put great store in what a priest or a priestess says? We may suspect that he doesn't, but he has to say this to attract the attention of Mino. Mino will take the trouble to learn what Socrates says these people say, because then Mino can regurgitate it to his friends back home. Now Socrates begins to reveal the mystery. This time he hasn't said that it's a mystery, but we may imagine that Mino would take it to be a mystery. Hade legusin tauti estin. What they say are these right here. Alas gope eisoi dokusi alethe legen. But consider if they seem to you to be saying true things. The verb I translated as consider, skopeo, is cognate with skeptikos, to be a skeptic, to ask questions, to examine everything. What Socrates has just asked Mino to do is not something that a sophist would ask Mino to do. Examining statements to see if they're true is, of course, a concern of dialectic, not of rhetoric. Rhetoric is not concerned with truth, but with persuading an audience. The fact that in what follows Mino asks no questions, never interrupts, suggests that he doesn't know how to check how to examine whether something is true, he simply accepts what he is told. And now we finally get to the account. Vasigar ten psuchen tu anthropu enai athanaton, kai totemen teliutan, hode aposnesken kadusi, totede palin gignestai, apolustai du depoted. For they say that the soul, psyche, of the human is immortal and at one time comes to an end, which they call to die, and at another time again comes to be, and it never perishes. We've already seen that Socrates made a mess of the theory of sense perception of Empedocles, and he's making yet another mess of a theory here. And we have to remember that he told Mino to examine if what he says, or sorry, if what they say 
is true. The interesting point about the account that Socrates presents us, or Mino, is that it is inconsistent in itself. If a human soul is immortal, it won't perish, this is correct, but it also won't come to an end, it won't die, and it won't come to be again. Anything which dies and then comes to be again is not immortal. If Mino had been using his intelligence and attention, he would have noticed this problem and he would have pointed out to Socrates quite simply that Socrates is misrepresenting the theory, which would be that if the soul is immortal, what happens at death is that the body perishes but the soul carries on. And when a human is born, the soul, which has been carrying on all the time, enters a new body. Socrates even goes out of his way to make the inconsistency obvious by describing the soul as athanatos and then using the verb apothnesken to die straight afterwards. The, if the soul is athanatos, the root of that is than, and the root of apothnesken is also than, Mino should have made the connection between Athanatos and Apothnesken and realized that this is impossible. You can't have something immortal being mortal. Philosophers will say that this is a small point. We can understand the theory that Plato is putting forward even if there is this small mistake. Obviously, this is the theory of reincarnation, and we really have no problem with it. The point is that this is something else. Socrates asked Mino to examine whether what was being said was true, and he gives him on a silver platter an inconsistency and yet Mino doesn't pick up on it. Mino should have interrupted and said, how is that possible? But he doesn't. And this is an important point. It will be an important point later on. This isn't the last time that Socrates will ask Mino to examine what is being said. And it won't be the last time that Mino applies his memory to remember what is said, but only so that he can impress people back home with his knowledge.